Good evening. Before I introduce our speaker, Evan Wolfson, I'd like to thank our other sponsors, uh, the Center for Advanced Study, Millercom 2006 Lecture Series, of course, McKinley Memorial Presbyterian Church, and especially Tom Seals of its More Light Committee, who was instrumental in helping us bring Mr. Wolfson here. Other sponsors include the Counseling Center, the Department of Human and Community Development, the Department of Political Science, Division of Community and Clinical Psychology, the Division of, of Counseling Psychology, Gender and Women's Studies Program, the Office of the Dean of Students and Student Affairs, the School of Social Work, Unit 1, the 85% Coalition, See You at the Altar, the Episcopal Church Foundation, the LGBT Roundtable, Pride, the Unitarian Universalist Church Social, Inter Social Action Interweave, the United Church of Christ Campus Ministry, the University YMCA, and the Sexual Orientation and Legal Issues Society of the College of Law. As you can see, we've brought together a, a, a host of community organizations and campus organizations and student organizations and departments and divisions uh, to bring Mr. Wolfson here. Thank you for your support. I also want to invite you all to join Evan after his lecture at a book signing and reception at the McKinley Foundation at the corner of Fifth and Daniel Streets in Champaign. There's parking available uh, in the parking garage for free that's right across from it. So you just go clear across campus. Marriage equality for same-sex couples has become a burning issue in the United States. Evan Wolfson is executive director of Freedom to Marry, the gay and non-gay partnership working to win marriage equality nationwide. Before founding Freedom to Marry, Evan served as, as marriage project director for Lambda Legal Defense and Education Fund, was co-counsel in the historic Hawaii marriage case, and participated in numerous gay rights and HIV AIDS cases. He previously served as associate counsel to Lawrence Walsh in the Iran-Contra investigation and as an assistant district attorney in Brooklyn, New York. Between graduating from Yale College and beginning at Harvard Law School, Evan spent two years with the Peace Corps in West Africa. Citing his national leadership on marriage equality and his appearance before the U.S. Supreme Court in Boy Scouts of America versus James Dale, the National Law Journal in 2000 named Evan Wolfson one of the 100 most influential lawyers in America. In 2004, he was named one of the Time 100, Time Magazine's list of the 100 most influential people in the world. Evan Wolfson's first book, Why Marriage Matters, America, Equality, and Gay People's Right to Marry, was published by Simon & Schuster in, Jul in July of 2004. In it, he puts a human face on the question of marriage equality, drawing on the stories of many gay and lesbian Americans who have been denied their constitutional right to marry. These include couples who have been committed to each other for years, sometimes decades. Many have children. Yet they and their families are routinely discriminated against in such matters as health benefits, inheritance, housing, immigration, family leave, property, retirement, and taxes. Wolfson explains that the demand for marriage equality is a question of civil rights. Please welcome Evan Wolfson as he talks to us on marriage as a human rights battlefield. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm actually going to stand in front of the podium since this sadly is as tall as I get. So, so I hope everybody can see and hopefully hear. This is a really great year to come to Illinois, and I appreciate the hosts and the MillerCom lecture series for making it possible for me to come back here and visit with you. This year, Illinois took a giant step toward fairness by a, enacting a non-discrimination law prohibiting discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity in the important concerns of our life regarding employment, housing, and public accommodations. Right here in Champaign-Urbana, just, just this week, the Champaign City Council took another small step toward fairness by enacting at the town level a partnership protection plan that provides for the city employees the ability to cover their partners, their family members, when it comes to access to health care and other human needs that are so important to families. Illinois is clearly wrestling with and grappling with and taking steps toward equality. 
And yet, sadly, in this state, as in so much of the country, lesbians and gay men, people right here in Illinois, are second-class citizens. Gay people in this state are deprived of the basic rights, the basic protections, the basic respect that every American deserves. Illinois, like America, is once again in a civil rights moment. As so often in our country, we come to a civil rights moment where all across the country, good people in the various states, in the courts, in the legislatures, around kitchen tables, grapple with the question of how we are treating people in our midst and the need for change. Once again, our country and this state have come to a civil rights moment. Like any civil rights moment in American history, this is about values. This is about things we believe and care about. The values at stake in this civil rights struggle, at this civil rights moment, in this state, in our country, the values I am fighting for are love, commitment, fairness, freedom, choice, treating others as you would wish to be treated. These are the values that are at stake in gay people's struggle to end their exclusion from the legal institution of marriage. Now marriage has always been a vocabulary, a battlefield in which larger questions of what kind of country we are going to have have been contested and discussed. Gay people are not the first people in American history to have to struggle against discrimination. We all know that. Gay people are not the first people to have to challenge discrimination and exclusion, even within marriage. Marriage, as I said, has always been a vocabulary, a battleground on which larger questions have been contested. The larger questions at stake in this struggle, as so often in American history, are questions such as, who makes important personal decisions in your life? You, as an American, as a free human being, or the government acting as a weapon or an agent on behalf of somebody else? Who makes those decisions in our lives? Questions as important as the proper relation and proper boundary between the individual and the government. Questions as important as the proper relation between and equality of women and men. Questions as important as the proper relation between and separation of church and state. Time and time again, these large defining questions, questions central to the American experience, have been debated and contested on the human rights battlefield of marriage. On the human rights battlefield of marriage, we in America, in the lifetime of many of the people in this room, have fought for and made changes in the institution of marriage to fulfill our country's commitment to the values that I described earlier of love and commitment and fairness and freedom and equality. In the lifetime of many of the people in this room, in just the past few decades, there have been at least four major battles and four major changes on this battlefield of marriage. On the human rights battlefield of marriage, we fought and ended government's interference in, in as important a personal choice as whether a couple must remain locked in for life to a marriage that may have failed or become abusive, or even violent, or whether that choice to divorce should properly rest with the couple, with the family, dealing with that difficult passage. And more than any other change that I'll discuss in the course of history, or the change with regard to ending sex discrimination in marriage that we're here to talk about tonight, 
more than any other change, ending that government interference in this important, important personal decision of divorce changed marriage from what it had historically been for much of American and world history, a union based on compulsion into what most Americans believe it properly to be today, a union based on love and commitment and the choice of the couple to build a life together. On the human rights battlefield of marriage, we fought and ended government interference in as important a personal decision as whether or not to have sex, whether or not to have sex without risking a pregnancy, whether to have children, whether to use contraception. Not so long ago in America, it was part of the law, part of the definition of marriage, defended by religious voices, defended by politicians as God-ordained and necessary to the survival of civilization, that an American couple, even a married couple, could not go to a pharmacy and purchase contraceptives. That was the law of our country, part of the definition of marriage. And on the human rights battlefield of marriage, we fought and ended that government intrusion into this very important cluster of personal decisions that belong to you, not to the government. On the human rights battlefield of marriage, we fought and ended race restrictions on who could marry whom. Not so long ago in our country, it was considered by many, indeed the majority, to be part of the government's function, to be part of God's plan, to be part of the way it had to be, to be necessary to the well-being of children, that the government should impose rules on us as to who is the right and wrong kind of person for you to marry. This is not ancient history. This is the living history of our time. From 1776, our nation's birth, until 1948, most of American history, not a single court in the country had the courage and clarity to say that these restrictions on marriage and who could marry whom based on race were cruel and wrong, not one court. And finally, in 1948, one court rose to this challenge and despite the thundering of religious voices defending race restrictions on who could marry whom, despite the politicians pandering to the worst in the American people. Finally, in 1948, one court on this human rights battlefield had the courage to speak up first. And that court was the California Supreme Court by a vote of four to three, the same ruling, the same number as the vote in Massachusetts a generation later when that state's high court became the first to strike down sex discrimination in marriage. And when that California Supreme Court made its historic ruling in 1948 by a vote of four to three, that court wrote that the essence of the right to marry is the freedom to marry the person you choose. Human beings, explained the court, are made bereft of worth and dignity by a legal definition of marriage that would treat them as if they were interchangeable like trains. It's not, the court explained, as if you can just catch the next one when government doesn't let you marry the person who is precious to you. As human beings, we seek to build our life not with a race, not with a sex, not with a category, but with a person. When the California Supreme Court became that first court to strike down these race restrictions on marriage in 1948, the polls showed 90% of the American people opposed interracial marriage. It took another 19 years of battling 
19 years of what I call in my book, Why Marriage Matters, patchwork, in which some states moved toward equality, while others resisted and even regressed, even got uglier and worse. 19 years of marches and bombings and lynchings and legislation and good people wrestling with the question and enough good people deciding that they had to break their silence and speak out against injustice. It took 19 years of civil rights struggle in our country before the question of ending race discrimination in marriage came again to the United States Supreme Court, a court that had gotten it wrong previously. And finally, after that 19 years of good people speaking out and other hearts and minds opening, the question of interracial marriage came before the United States Supreme Court again in the best name case ever, Loving versus Virginia. There is a God. And in Loving, the United States Supreme Court agreed with the California Supreme Court and said that these race restrictions on who could marry whom were cruel and un-American and wrong, a violation of equality and a violation of the fundamental right to marry itself. When the United States Supreme Court in Loving made that historic decision, ending finally as late as 1967, race restrictions that were part of the definition of marriage, defended by religion, defended by politicians. When the US Supreme Court made that loving decision, the polls showed 70%, 70% of the American people opposed interracial marriage. Now ask yourselves, what kind of country would we have? What kind of state would Illinois be if the courts had listened, if the courts had succumbed to those pressures of the 90%, the 70%, the prejudices of the majority, the passions of the moment. Ask yourself, what kind of country would we have? What kind of state would this be if the opponents of equality then had succeeded in doing what the opponents of equality today seek to do, go state by state and assault the federal constitution itself so as to cement discrimination into the federal and state constitutions to prevent the next generation from ending restrictions believed at one time to be right and necessary and part of God's plan. What would our country look like? The opponents of equality are here today. They're filming this talk. The Illinois Family Institute, an organization that is seeking to cement into the Illinois state constitution an anti-gay constitutional amendment aimed at preventing Illinois citizens and future generations from ending discrimination against Illinois gay citizens. And I welcome their being here tonight because it's important that we hear from one another and talk to one another and lay out the values and the discussion and the argument and help dispel fears. Because on this human rights battlefield of marriage, we have seen time and time again, as in this case of race restrictions, that at one time, a majority sincerely but wrongly believes that discrimination is needed and it's only when enough good people speak up that our country moves to the respect and inclusion and equality and freedom that defines America to me. And on this human rights battlefield of marriage, there was yet one more major struggle, major change in the so-called traditional definition of marriage within the lifetime of many of us right here in this room. And that was ending the legal subordination of women in marriage. Not so long ago, it was part of the definition of marriage. It was part of the law. It was part of the way some religious voices said it has to be, God wants it to be, that women who married men 
not only lost legal rights, which they did, but actually lost their own legal identity as a separate person. Under the definition of marriage at one time in every state, women who married men became, as the parlance of the time had it, submerged in one flesh, and that flesh, of course, was his, and he got to own property, make decisions, serve on juries, write contracts, take out mortgages, take out loans, and she got to remain at home. This was part of the law of every state. It was part of the definition of marriage considered to be traditional and historical and necessary. That whole Mr. and Mrs. His Name thing reflected the legal concept of marriage sincerely believed in by many people that women who enter into marriage with men are necessarily subordinate. Well, that was wrong too, and we changed it too. But this is not, again, some artifact of ancient times. These battles I described for you tonight are not things that happened during the Civil War. I myself, as a young attorney back in my hair days, worked on the case that ended what was called the marital rape exemption. Now, the marital rape exemption was part of the quote unquote definition of marriage, part of the law in at one time every state that said that a husband cannot be prosecuted for raping his wife because he's entitled to take what belongs to him. This was understood to be the law. This was understood to be what marriage meant. Well, it was wrong, and we changed it. And when we made that change, it was not only in states like Alabama or Utah. It was right in New York, where I'm from. And this was not 100 years ago. This was 1984. Time and time again, on the human rights battlefield of marriage, our country has wrestled with larger questions of what kind of country we're going to be and the need to change the way we are treating Americans, families, couples and their kids in our midst. We are met on this human rights battlefield once again. Lesbians and gay men who seek the freedom to marry seek precisely what non-gay Americans, our brothers and sisters, seek. The tangible and intangible protections and responsibilities that marriage brings to couples. What gay families right here in Illinois are saying is that couples who have made a personal commitment in their life, couples here in Illinois who are doing the hard work of marriage day to day, who are caring for a partner and building a life together, sharing dreams and doing work, couples who've made a personal commitment and doing the work of marriage, who are raising children, who are caring for their aging parents, who are going to work, who are paying taxes, who are contributing to the community. These couples right here in this state who have made that personal commitment in their life deserve an equal commitment under law. And that commitment in our society is called marriage. Marriage is a legal institution. The government does not issue communion licenses. The government does not issue bar mitzvah licenses. The government issues marriage licenses because marriage is a legal institution, an institution regulated by the states under the United States and state constitutions commands of equality and freedom and respect for all Americans. And in this legal institution, People willing to take on the commitment, willing to play by the rules, willing to accept the responsibilities, 
enter into a safety net of tangible and intangible, personal and practical, emotional and economic, social and spiritual meanings that come with and only with the freedom to marry. Same-sex couples, whether raising kids or otherwise, right here in Illinois, want and need the freedom to marry for the same mix of reasons as non-gay people have and exercise that freedom to marry. And the question before Illinois, the question before each one of you, the question being avoided by the Illinois Family Institute, and the question that our country is wrestling with in the civil rights movement, the civil rights moment, is quite simple. What reason does the government have for denying these committed couples, these Americans, these Illinois families, the same equal freedom to marry, the, the ability to enter into a relationship of responsibility and respect with the person that person loves. And courts from Canada and around this country, as they look at the evidence, listen to the arguments, hear what the other side has to say, hear what the couples themselves have to say, the stories they tell of how the denial of marriage affects them and their kids, as courts in the clear, cool, dispassionate light of a courtroom, listen to what the government has to say to see if there's a reason for continuing this exclusion are increasingly telling us that there is no good reason. In America, when the government does not have a sufficient and good reason for treating some of us differently from others, in America, the government may not continue to do so. There is no good reason for saying to a person willing to take on a commitment and seeking to care for the person that she or he is building a life with and willing to play by the same rules and willing to accept the same responsibilities, there is no good reason for the government to put obstacles in that person's path. Marriage, as I told you, is the gateway to this vast array, this irreplaceable array of protections and responsibilities that literally cover every area of life from birth to death with taxes in between. If you're aging and concerned that your partner in life receive the social security support that you paid for, to be denied the freedom to marry means that you don't have that ability to make sure your partner is cared for. If you're a binational couple, one of you coming to this country to work or live or contribute from another land, to be denied the freedom to marry is to be told that your family may not remain united securely in the country that you love. To be denied the freedom to marry is to be denied access to medical decision-making, the ability to participate in providing coverage to your partner at every level, federal, state, and private, when it comes to health coverage and other important necessities. To be denied the freedom to marry is to be denied important parenting rights. And if you're a child, it's to be denied the statement and support that comes to children when their family is recognized as intact and one. There is no reason to continue the denial of these important tangible protections to Americans seeking to deal with the day-to-day -day ups and downs of life and to cope with the hardships and crises that can come to any of us in life in our precious time on this planet. And there is no good reason for the government to say to a group of Americans, a group of families here in Illinois, that their love is less important, 
less worthy, less fully human, less entitled to full respect and citizenship than the love and commitment of others. Marriage, as I said, is a vocabulary. It is a vocabulary in which our society talks about values of love and commitment and dedication and self-sacrifice and caring and interdependence. It is a statement so important that most people wear its symbol on their hand. Being married and whom you're married to is one of the first things you tell people about yourself. It is a statement that this is the primary person to whom I have made a commitment, the primary person with whom I am building a life. And government has no business telling Americans that they may not make that statement with full respect under the law. Government has no business saying to gay kids that they dare not dream of a life together with a committed partner. And government has no business saying to non-gay kids watching what we say and do in this civil rights moment that it is OK to look down on people who are different from you. There is no good reason for this discrimination, and it must end. And it must end in Illinois, as it must end throughout the United States. How do we bring it to an end? Illinois, like America, right now at this time of civil rights engagement, civil rights conversation, is divided roughly in three groups. One group of Americans, one group of people right here in this community, support ending discrimination and the exclusion of gay people from the life of the community. They have come to understand that the stereotypes and myths are false, just as other stereotypes and myths about African Americans, about Latinos, about Jews, about Irish Americans, about women are cruel and wrong. They have rejected the stereotypes, seen the truth of the humanity of these people, these gay and lesbian people living here in Illinois. And they have embraced the commitment our country has to fairness, including the freedom to marry. Another third group, another group, are adamantly opposed not just to marriage for gay people, but to gay people. They're opposed to gay people. They're opposed to homosexuality. They think people like me are ill or immoral and should have no respect, no protection, no place in American law or life. They would deny any measure of protection and support to people like me and our partners and our families. The amendment being pushed by the Illinois Family Institute would not only deny marriage rights to committed couples here in Illinois, but any other measure of protection. It is intended to deny any measure of protection, partnership, health coverage, civil union, whatever you want to call it, they're against it because they're not just against marriage for same-sex couples, they're against gay people, and they have a larger political agenda that is anti-choice, anti-women's equality, and sadly, anti the separation of church and state that actually is our country's best safeguard for religious freedom as well as personal freedom. And then there's a third group. And that third group right here in Illinois are the people I think of as the reachable but not yet reached. And who are those people here in our midst, here in our community? They're people who are, by and large, uncomfortable talking about gay people, uncomfortable talking about homosexuality, or sex for that matter, or sexuality, and they too often think of all those things as the same thing, reducing gay people to just sex, when in fact we are human beings, and sex is only part of our lives, as it is part of our non-gay brothers and sisters' lives. They're uncomfortable talking about these questions. They'd rather not have to. 
Many of them feel anxiety about the path our country is on. They feel our country is headed in the wrong direction. They rightly and understandably feel pressures on their own families. Some of them feel pressure on their own marriage. And without something to help them, it's easy for them to displace that discomfort and pressure and anxiety and fears onto somebody else's call to blame somebody else. But on the other hand, this middle third, this middle group, are not haters. They are not deeply anti-gay. They do believe in fairness. They do believe, particularly when we can remind them they believe, in live and let live, and freedom and choice and equality under the law. And so what is it that we, those of us who share the vision of an Illinois dedicated to equality, of an America committed to freedom and equal worth, what is it that we need to do to help that reachable middle embrace fairness? Well, the answer is that right here, individually and working together, we have the obligation to give the people in the middle, our fellow Americans, the members of this community wrestling with these civil rights questions, with the need for fairness and with their own discomfort, the two things that will move them to embrace fairness, the two things that the Illinois Family Institute does not want them to have. And those two things are, number one, information, the truth, and number two, the time to absorb it. Now, what's the information they need? Quite simply, it's that this is about real people, human beings, families right here in Illinois, couples who are struggling, who, as I said, are doing the work of marriage right in this community, raising kids, paying taxes, fighting over who takes out the garbage. People who are doing that work of marriage in their life right here in Illinois. This is not some question in the abstract. It's not a hypothetical. It's not a freebie vote on how you feel about gays in Massachusetts. This is about how Illinois treats its families, the same-sex couples and their kids and loved ones and the non-gay people who care about them right here. And it's about how those families are harmed by the denial of the freedom to marry and by the discriminatory assaults on their families coming from the right wing, from being excluded from the safety net of legal protections described earlier, of being denied these tangible and intangible security and protections and duties and obligations that help support families and that they need for their families. It is our job to connect the dots and help people understand that this is about real people. And this is who gay people really are, not stereotypes, but real. And this is how the denial of marriage affects us, affects them, right here in Illinois, and how there's no good reason for that discrimination. That's the information. And they need time. They need time to push past their discomfort, to break through the stereotypes that many of them have grown up with, the silence about this that has too long allowed stereotypes and fears to, to shut the conversation down. They need time, which means that those of us who care about equality in this civil rights moment here in Illinois must speak up now. Non-gay as well as gay, we must speak the truth about why marriage matters, why Equality matters. Why fairness is needed for these families and why they must embrace an end to this discrimination just as we have had to embrace ends to other discrimination on this battlefield of marriage in the past. We must give people the time to take this in and think it through and open their hearts and minds because sometimes they're not going to get it or agree with it, or be ready for it, or even want to hear it on the first conversation. They may need five conversations, five examples, five instances that prompt them to think anew, as Abraham Lincoln said. But they can't have five until they have the first. And so we must use this time now, this time of civil rights conversation, 
to talk with our neighbors here in Illinois, person to person, group to group, and not allow silence to be filled with the distortions and fear mongering of those who would take our country in the wrong direction. Information and time. Now the good news is that the history of our country is that despite much ugliness, despite much discrimination, despite much needless exclusion and pain, our country does time and time again wrestle with these larger questions and come out in support of equality. Time and time again, people in Illinois, as the people of America generally, despite being told by some in the name of religion or in the name of politics or even in the name of law that discrimination is the right thing and has to be, the American people have shown that when enough good people speak up and give them the information and time they need, they can rise to fairness. And sure enough, we are seeing now that once again on this human rights battlefield of marriage, discrimination and needless exclusion are coming to an end. Unlike two years ago, we now have in the United States the first state where same-sex couples are able to legally marry. And look at what has happened in that state. The state, of course, is Massachusetts. Last year, the opponents of equality, just as they're pushing these anti-gay attacks here in Illinois, even before you've ended discrimination, worked in Massachusetts to try to push a constitutional amendment aimed at taking away the precious freedom to marry that these couples were prepared to celebrate. And the legislature in Massachusetts on first reading last year narrowly passed that anti-gay amendment and sent it forward for second reading. It came up for second reading about a month ago. And the legislature, with that amendment, voted 157 to 39 to reject it. Why the change? Why in Massachusetts did we see the anti-gay amendment at first gain some traction because of people's anxiety and fear, and then be overwhelmingly rejected just a year and a half later? Two reasons. Number one, and most important, because the good people of Massachusetts, and ultimately the legislators too, in the course of that year and a half, had a chance to see with their own eyes the reality of marriage discrimination coming to an end. They got to see with their own eyes the reality that when gay couples are allowed to marry, families are helped and no one is hurt. If there was any place in the country where if marriage for gay people was something bad, people ought to feel a sense of urgency and determination to stamp it out, it ought to be Massachusetts. And yet Massachusetts, the first state that has had the chance to see it for real, not just scary right-wing rhetoric and dangerous fear-mongering, but the reality, the people of Massachusetts rejected an attempt to undo the advance for marriage because they saw with their own eyes that this was a good, not a bad. The gay couples, thousands of whom have now gotten legally married in Massachusetts in the last year and a half, more than 6,000 couples have now taken on the responsibilities and commitment of marriage on full and equal terms. And you know what? The gays did not use up all the marriage licenses. There's still plenty of marriage left to share. Massachusetts has the lowest divorce rate in the United States, and there have been no locusts. <laughs> Families helped and no one hurt. So the first important thing that makes a difference for people is making it real, making it personal, talking about why it matters and how it affects real people, not just some abstract concept, not such a, such a, 
some scary right-wing rhetoric. And the second reason we saw that change in Massachusetts, that rejection of this discriminatory amendment, is that the good people who cared about equality, who cared about fairness for families, didn't just sit around and wait for it to, to bubble up from the goodness of people's hearts. They got to work. In Massachusetts, non-gay as well as gay people came together and took the conversation, took the stories of real families, took their personal testimony about why this matters and why decent people have to think it through to their neighbors. They organized and they got to work. They didn't allow the right-wing groups to go unchallenged. They got up and they took a stand against discrimination and for fairness in their community. If Massachusetts can end discrimination and unfairness against families in their state, if the California legislature, the legislature of our nation's largest state, can vote in support of a bill to end discrimination in marriage, if our nation's largest trading partner and closest neighbor, Canada, can marry same-sex couples for more than two years now and be doing exceptionally well on every measure of social well-being we look to, the health of the pop population, the feeling of freedom, the sense of community. If Roman Catholic Spain can go from General Francisco Franco in 1975 to marriage equality in 2005, so can Illinois. Information and time, the truth and enough good people, non-gay as well as gay, who care about equality, who care about fairness, who don't want to see discrimination cemented in, who don't want to deny the next generation their freedom and opportunity to live in a better world, who don't want to take away from families what other families cherish, who don't believe that government should be putting obstacles in the path of people seeking to care for one another. Enough good people, non-gay and gay, right here in Illinois, making a personal commitment and a collective decision to fight for the change that's needed, can make Illinois the kind of state and America the kind of country that I believe we all want to see for ourselves, our loved ones, our children, and the next generation. Thank you. Hi. Um, I guess I'm a part of the right-wing evil people you're talking about, but I think I didn't it, say evil. it's important to, uh, I think, get beyond this, you know, we're the good guys trying to fight the bad guys who are trying to, I mean, I don't. I didn't really hear anything. I mean, I came here today wanting to understand the argument more, um, but I don't think I really gained anything, um, other than you know we're the good people trying to fight for the good things, and the bad people are trying to stop us. Um, I mean, so I have a question. I think maybe can put us in a little more productive direction. Um, you were talking about you know there's no good reason to you know have this kind of regulation. No good reason for this or that. Can you think of, and I'm not trying to make the slippery slope argument, but can you think of you know, a good reason to limit marriage to two people? Because it seems to me you know, that if you ask a kid what's a marriage, they say you know, man and a woman. So that, that means two people opposite genders. So if we take away the opposite gender um, part, I mean, what's, are there any good reasons to limit marriage to uh, two individuals? What's your good reason? My good reason for uh -huh. limiting marriage? Just yeah. to two people or uh -huh. to... to two, that's what you're asking, for two people. Be, my, good, my good reason is, is the Bible. Oh, that's your reason? Yeah. That's your only reason? Because have you read the Bible? Yeah. Are you aware that actually the Bible does not limit marriage to two people? Mm. So hopefully you actually have a better reason. But I want to well, actually go, go beyond that and actually okay. answer your question. So sure. You see. Uh, I, I actually think probably you have some other reasons 
because as I said, the Bible actually doesn't get you there. And of course, as you also know, there's not one Bible, there are many Bibles. And Americans have many different interpretations of the Bible, many different religions, and we are, as I'm sure you would agree, a country based on the idea of religious freedom. Religious freedom, I'm sure, is important to you. Why would it be any less important to anyone else? So, Right. No, I, no, I heard what you said, I'm, and I'm answering your question. And one answer to your question is if, if you're quite serious about your point, that you're basing your notion that marriage should be limited to two people on the Bible, you actually really need to read the Bible again, because that's actually not what it says. But, but I think more important is the larger point you're making. And I want to point out what you, have, what you did in your question. The first thing you did was said you heard nothing tonight. So apparently what you didn't hear is the whole discussion about how gay couples seek the same protections and responsibilities for their families that couples you like seek for their families. So we're talking here about couples. And apparently you didn't hear anything and you didn't offer anything to suggest what the reason would be to deny these couples the same protections and responsibilities that other couples have. And in fact, that is the question on the table. The question is, what reason does the government have for saying to these couples that they should not have the same respect, the same rules, the same responsibilities, the same opportunity to support their family? And I describe what they are. Social security, inheritance, taxation, the personal commitment and statement that's reinforced by society, the statement. All of that you heard, but apparently meant nothing to you when it comes to these couples, although presumably it's very important for you when it comes to those couples. And so the point I make back to you is that what gay people are saying and what I have said to you tonight is not, let's have no rules. That's not what the couples in Illinois are saying. What they're saying is, let us have the same protections, the same rules, the same precious choice that you have. If you have the freedom to marry one person you love, why shouldn't someone else? And you have not offered a reason for the government to continue denying that precious choice to someone else. What you have done, as many opponents of equality do seek to do, is try to change the subject. And when people bring up, let's talk about polygamy, let's talk about this, what it means is they don't have a reason for the question that we are actually here to talk about tonight, which is what good does it serve when the government puts obstacles in the path of these couples and the kids they're raising. If I could add just a little bit to that and then ask a question, is that I think you talk about the rules of, of equality, um, the rules of a democratic society, of a democracy, and as opposed to a theocracy, which is, I think is what a lot of people are trying to get at. You know, they want the rules according to their belief, their religion, as opposed to freedom of religion. But what my question is, is uh, relates to on this campus, being here on this campus at the University of Illinois, about 40,000 students, uh, I interact with students from various LGBT groups on campus, and I get a sense, very large sense actually, of apathy towards this topic. Uh, you've got students, not just LGBT students, but heterosexual students that, you know, they're not in committed relationships. They're not in any relationships a lot of times. Um, they don't even have it on their radar. So how is it that you can convey to these students that are not here, um, hey, this is important? Mm -hmm. You make two very good points. And on the first point, on the religious point, I, I actually really want to go back to something I did say earlier that maybe some people didn't hear, which is that I began by saying this is a conversation about values. This is a conversation about love and commitment and respect and doing unto others as you would want done to you and supporting relations of care and not putting obstacles in people's path and rendering unto Caesar what is Caesar's, having the law do what the law is supposed to do while churches remain free to do what they choose to do. 
these are important values. For many of us, they are religious values. They are certainly moral values. And in America, they're also civic values. And so this is very much a conversation in which people of faith are summoned to not just repeat buzzwords or make assertions that actually have no textual support, but instead to really grapple with the values and then to take into account also the point you just made, which is that one of the great gifts we have as Americans is the idea that we respect one another's religious freedom. Government can never tell any church, any synagogue, temple, or mosque who should get married in that house of worship or that faith. That belongs to the religion. The religious rights, R-I-T-E-S, of marriage are up to each faith to decide for itself based on people's views. But no religion should be imposing its view, its faith, on all other Americans through the weapon of the government. No religion should dictate who gets the legal right, R-I-G-H-T, to marry, which is regulated by the government. And to respect that difference, that boundary, is the best safeguard we have as Americans for our personal freedom and also for religious freedom. And people of faith ought to be the first to stand up to respect that boundary in the interest not only of American freedom, but in the interests of religious freedom. And on your second question, which is about students here and people generally, I actually think, number one, many young people have a tremendous hunger to be involved in, this, in shaping society, and doing good, and fighting for the better, and standing up against stereotypes. They don't necessarily know how to plug in. And the fact of the matter is the opponents of equality now are trying to prevent those students, those young people, from finding their voice. The reason they're rushing to try to cement discrimination into constitutions is tried to, to, to try to deny the next generation the ability to think this through, really grapple in their hearts, push past stereotypes, and shape the society they want to live in. If, if the opponents trusted the next generation, they wouldn't need constitutional amendments. So the real challenge is not so much apathy. It's, I think, all of us, gay and non-gay, national as well as state and local, finding one another, come, bringing one another together, and creating the action steps that people can take to really make a difference, to bring this dialogue, this conversation, these personal asks, person to person, group to group, here in Champaign-Urbana and in Illinois and in the country. And the good news for that is that people don't have to start from scratch. Whoever wants to be a nucleus of action and rally others and tap into that energy and that youthful commitment to make a difference can go online at freedomtomarry.org or can look in the appendix in my book, Why Marriage Matters, both of which, one for free, the other for a mere whatever it is, $10, list ways in which good people, gay and non-gay, can get involved and take action. And we need to take that information and share it with our neighbors, our friends, our colleagues, our fellow students, and help them find action that they can take in this state. And the action is, is in one form or another related to the idea of making your voice heard and talking to other people, whether person to person or group to group. And I don't actually think apathy is the big issue. I think giving people a sense of empowerment and an opportunity to get involved and creating the action that actually summons people to action. And then when they see that action and they see the effect and see that they can make a difference, they want to do more. And you go from there. Other questions? Yeah, hi. I hi. thank you the presentation. I really enjoyed it. I think it was a great presentation because I have many questions. Um, one of them is, what happens if you feel that the language of marriage constrains you because you probably want to be in a relationship, in a committed relationship with more than one person? And how do you um, factor into the language of marriage those who are transgender or intersex? And uh, how do we think of marriage as a social construction more than 
as her reality. You mentioned many times during the talk that this reality, and I tend to believe that is more a historical construction. Um, so I have these three issues and I'd like to discuss them. With right, you. well those are all kind of widely different questions, as you know. I mean, to take the second one, since we already addressed the first one, uh, people who are transgendered or intersex have the same interest in being able to marry a person they love and to be able to make that decision and take on the commitment and play by the rules as any other person. And so the, the really important question is, what justification does the government have for imposing a different sex restriction on who can marry? And if the government doesn't have a good reason, if it doesn't serve a legitimate and sufficient purpose, the government shouldn't be doing it anymore. For most of human history, marriage was very gendered, if you will. Marriage was based on the idea of subordination of women to men. And for economic reasons in most civilizations through society, families needed to be built that way because people needed the labor that way. The fisherman needed the fishwife to take the goods to market. And you could go on through countless examples. All those gendered terms for occupations reflected the idea that marriage was, in most societies, an economic unit serving economic purposes. Now, it also served other purposes and meant other things to the individuals involved. But as a legal matter, as a historical matter, that was the concept. The concept of marriage that existed throughout most of human history was very, very different from what we as Americans would think today marriage ought to be. And even as we heard earlier in the exchange, what the opponents of equality like to say today, the one man, one woman idea, that too is a relatively new historical concept that was not part of the history of marriage for much of its history. And even to the extent it was part, the way in which that woman and man interacted was very, very different from the way that most of us think the law ought to embody today. So we have seen these changes and made these changes. And so the real question we come back to is, what reason is there for the government to maintain, out of all the things that have changed in marriage, and the transformation of marriage from this union based on compulsion to a union based on commitment and choice, and the transformation of marriage from a union based on domination to a union based on love and commitment between two equals, changes we have made in the legal institution of marriage in America and in other countries. Amongst all these changes, what reason exists now for perpetuating the different sex restriction that deprives gay couples who have made that commitment in life from being able to make the commitment in law? And we have yet to hear tonight, and I submit to you that there isn't any good reason to continue that discrimination. We know that fortunately, not all religious organizations are anti-equality. In fact, we heard at the beginning that your talk this evening is being sponsored by a number of progressive uh, religious organizations in town. That's right. And I was wondering if you could share with us a little bit of your vision for the role of progressive religious organizations in the, in the fight for marriage right. equality. That is, that is exactly right. Just as religions were divided in the struggles over ending slavery, and some defended slavery while others fought to end it. Just as religions were divided over the questions of racial justice that we fought and that continue in our country, and some defended segregation and subordination while others spoke prophetically for equality. Just as religions were divided over the equality of women and remain so today, where at least one large denomination in the, in the United States within the last few years reaffirmed its view that the woman should subordinate herself to her husband. Just as religions have been divided on these larger questions fought on the battlefield of marriage, so religion is divided today on the question of ending the exclusion of committed gay couples from marriage. And as you rightly point out, some religions have spoken out against gay equality. Some have spoken out against gay people, period. While others have actually spoken out in support of ending this discrimination. 
I believe that those who have a religious view that embraces equality can actually be messengers for two important messages. The first, and I actually think most important, is that this is about values, this is about people, this is about values of faith, the deeper values related to love and commitment and fairness and treating people as you want to be treated, the values I discussed earlier. And I think religious leaders and people of faith can talk in human and compassion, compassionate and humane and religious terms about these values and remind each and every one of us of our obligations to treat others right. For some, this is a religious question. And those religions deserve respect and they need voice. And I think religious leaders and people of faith who embrace fairness can also deliver another message. And that is to reaffirm the message that it is wrong and dangerous in America to invite the government to be taking sides on battles between religions and to be picking which religion is right and which religion is wrong. The very first questioner and I, questioner and I had a disagreement over what I, what I imagine his Bible says about the number of wives, for example, that King Solomon had. We can disagree about that. And you know what? He's entitled to his opinion, and I do respect that. I'm not here to tell him what he should believe. I'm not here to tell him what Bible he should read. But what we ought to be able to agree on, American to American, is that we don't use the government as a weapon, because that's dangerous. Think of it this way. A Jewish couple cannot, in America, march down to a cathedral or to your church and bang on the door and demand to get married there. Even though Illinois has a very strong civil rights law already protecting that Jewish couple, they cannot, armed with that law, go to the church, bang on the door, and demand to get married there. Because government has no business telling any church who can get married there. But it is equally wrong for the minister or priest in that church to pick up the phone and call over to City Hall and say to the clerk, don't give that Jewish couple a marriage license because according to my Bible, they don't believe in Jesus or they aren't willing to take on the sacrament that my religion believes in or they have a different religious view or no religious view. The priest cannot do that in America because there's a difference between what we do here as Americans in our faith and in our beliefs and what the government may do in regulating a legal institution. And I think that message too is a message that clergy and people of faith can credibly and meaningfully deliver. That as people of faith, we all have an interest in protecting the religious freedom, including the freedom to disagree without legal discrimination. Your talk today raised any number of, um, of thought-provoking points, and I, I just wanted to pick up on a couple of them. One, uh, pointing out how often it's been the case that on human rights issues, um, the great majority of the public um, at the time that the breakthrough was made uh, are not supportive of equality of rights. And the other one, the phrase that you used about um, people need time. Uh -huh. And that, I guess that, that raised an old, the old question for me that Martin Luther King um, talked about in a letter in a Birmingham jail. Um, you've, letter from a Birmingham jail, you've, the, the, the issue, I mean, where people are, you're always told, people are always told in human rights issues, patience and now is not the time. But there's a reason. There's a reason sometimes that they're told that, and that's because there are costs at times to demanding a right, uh, because other, other objectives that you have may um, be discredited or may be weakened. You've heard 
what I assume is a canard, but the canard that, that um, uh, in California, uh, the uh, debate over gay marriage um, hurt the Democrats in the 2004 election and helped lead to their defeat. So can I ask you, how does one decide what is the time, even for something that involves what is clearly the right thing to do and what is clearly someone's right? Or is it always the time? Well, of course, as you know, Martin Luther King in that letter said, the time is always ripe to do right. So we could take it at that. And if it's good enough for him, it probably is good enough for you and me. But let me actually take your question in its pieces. First of all, you, you called it a canard, but then you repeated it. And I think it really is important to understand that actually it is simply false. It is a myth, this idea that gay people's quest for equality or the marriage debate cost, in this case, Kerry or the Democrats the election. It's just not true. The numbers are there. If you look at the numbers, as has now been repeated over and over and over, and yet people persist in repeating the myth, the states that had anti-gay measures on their ballot, actually Bush did less well in than comparable states nearby where the ballot measures were not on the ballot. Kerry won the states that were que the questionable states, the states that weren't forgone for Bush, like Mississippi and Utah and so on, the states where it was actually in play, Michigan, Oregon, Kerry won. The percentage of evangelical Christians who turned out to vote in 2004 was no greater than the percentage of evangelical Christians who turned out in 2000. After the election, there was a deliberate effort to spin this very narrow election into a mandate for, in the case of gay people, bigotry, and for a other political agenda. But there was no such mandate, and we have to simply stop repeating something that's not true. And people don't have to take my word for it. Go online, go to our website. There's a whole section, and it's not quoting me. It's quoting all kinds of analysis, census data, the poll, polling experts and now analysts. This has been repeated and clarified over and over and over. So we just have to stop acting as if we believe something that we actually intellectually know is not true. To collude in silence is precisely what the right wing would like you to do. So now to your larger question, your larger question. When is the time right? Well, you cite Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail, and as I'm sure you well know, King's letter from a Birmingham jail, which again, anybody can read, it's online, it's quoted in my book. His letter was not written to the bigots, to the haters, to the opponents of civil rights. His letter was a letter of anger and frustration that he was venting to his allies, particularly ministers, clergy, the so-called moderates, the, the actual moderates, the so-called progressives, the actual progressives, who under the pressures of a civil rights struggle were also heard to say, wait, don't speak up now, don't march now, Birmingham is a mistake, don't put this before the country, you might mess up other things, etc." And King's magnificent letter, worth reading by everyone, is a letter of protest and frustration and rebuking that. And what he says in that letter is very, very true. Tension, disagreement, confusion, uncertainty are there. They're there already. These are not caused by those who seek equal participation in the American dream, they're there. It's our job, those of us who believe in an America that can do better, to help bring that tension to the surface so that people do wrestle in their hearts and come forward to equality. When Lyndon Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act into law in 1964, he did so at the same moment as he turned to an aide and said, this may cost us the South. Is there anyone in this room that thinks that the Democratic Party of that day and even the Republicans who stood up there out of selfless interest were wrong to stand up and make our country better on questions of racial justice? It is wrong to suggest 
that those of us who favor equality and fairness and want to reach out to our neighbors somehow must not do so because we may cause other things to happen. By contrast, when more people speak up and more fair-minded questions ask, are asked and people grapple with this, our country will get there faster. And that's, in fact, what we're seeing. In Massachusetts, as I described, last year they were against it. This year they're for it because they've seen it. We must assume, we must believe that our fellow Americans are capable, capable of fairness. And by contrast, the silence, the sitting on the sidelines of too many moderates, too many progressives, too many allies, too many people who are pro-gay, who, who want to be fair to gay, but aren't ready yet, that silence is what allows the opponents to gain ground and to stir fear and to take our country in the wrong direction. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah. My question, I guess, is more of a plea for advice. OK. Um, I did my undergraduate work here, and now I'm doing my graduate work here. And um, as a graduate student, I teach. Um, and uh, part of the last class that I taught was a conversation and discussion section about this very topic. Um, they, I would have welcomed the first gentleman who had, your, who had a question in my class. Mm -hmm. um, after that conversation that we all had in class, I had them write on cards what they really thought. And I got a lot of cards back that said, you know, I didn't disagree, but I, I, I disagree completely with everything that everybody said about, you know, how this is okay and all these people are going to hell and all, all these things. Um, but not one of them said anything out loud. And when I was an undergrad, the situation was exactly the same, except I didn't get to read the cards. So my question is, how do you suggest that we can engage these people in such a way so that there can be a dialogue. Because it's not going to do anybody any good if you just kind of put out an opinion and nobody says anything. You can't have five conversations if you can't even have one. I, I absolutely agree with you. And I'm very happy that you asked that you came and asked your question, even though I don't agree with you and you don't agree with me. I think that is a good thing. I'm glad that the Illinois Family Institute is here filming this. I hope they actually run the thing in its entirety and don't just cut and edit it, but actually put it up there so that people can judge for themselves. I, I didn't forbid them to tape, though I could have. I, I welcome it because I actually do think you're absolutely right that as, as Americans, as neighbors, as fellow citizens, we really do need to talk with each other. And even if we start from a place of disagreement, it's much better that we actually put that on the table. So I totally agree with you on that. Having said that, I think there's another point to be made too. And that is that, as I described to you earlier, with the 90% opposed to interracial marriage when the country took that first important court case, and the 70% that were still opposed to interracial marriage when it came to the United States Supreme Court, and after 19 years, that court had to make its decision, doing its job, not take a poll, not wait to read everybody's card, but do the right thing. History tells us that not everybody is going to get there at the same time, and in fact, not everybody's going to get there in agreement at all. And that's part of being in a free country. It wasn't until 1992, for example, that a majority of Americans said interracial marriage was OK. So the point of that is that those of us who actually do believe in ending this discrimination and who really do understand that there is no good reason to continue it really can't wait for that group of people who may never agree with us and who have a very different vision of what this country ought to be like, but instead need to focus our effort on encouraging conversation and encouraging thought in that 20 or 30 percent in the middle who really are wrestling, who really actually are open-minded, and who are not going to listen to an hour of conversation and say, I didn't hear a single thing, but my reason for what I believe is the Bible. People who say that are absolutely entitled to say that. That's their right as Americans. But they're not listening. They're not going to hear it. They're not going to move. But not everybody is like that. So most most people actually want to do more. 
Excuse me? So your suggestion is talk to the middle. Yes. Yes. Don't get hung up on trying to change everybody. Work with the people who actually do have an open mind. Now, having said that, many of those people who have that open mind have serious questions, have serious concerns. And I totally agree with you that it's not okay to just dismiss them as bigots or a word I never used, evil, or anything like that. In fact, I wrote my book, Why Marriage Matters, as a conversation with those people, people who I think are really good, decent people, but who are not in agreement with me and who are really trying to think it through. And each chapter in the book is a genuine question that I think they are asking. I mean, the chapter headings are things like, will, this, will ending marriage discrimination be bad for society? How will it affect children? Is this a question of religion? And how does religion relate to it? Why can't you call it something else? Why not use another word? How will marriages in one state affect other states? Is marriage equality a question of civil rights? Why does this matter? Why are we talking about this now? These, these are the chapters. And they're not just polemics. They are actual conversations with people in which I, I quote the opponents. And I quote the couples. And I give a little bit of law and a little bit of history in order to allow people to actually reason this through and take a deep breath and, and, and open their hearts and minds. And some won't, but many will. And our job is to actually reach for those who can. Questions? Yes. Uh, you wondered why uh, the government should involve themselves in this. And the government should be concerned with the common good of all, not just a small group, and in society as a whole in the next generation. And the concern is, on the part of many, is that um, the next generation should be have the ability to be raised as previous generations for the thousands and thousands of years in history um, by a mother and a father and so that they can have those role models and so that they won't be confused when they grow up. And uh, I even heard it quoted recently that Rosie o uh, O'Donnell's daughter said, Mommy, uh, why can't I have a daddy? And Rosie said to her, well, uh, because you have a mommy that likes another mommy. And, but the child wants a father. Yeah. He wants that role model. Right. Well, I appreciate that question. And clearly, you actually listened to the debate I had with Focus on the Family. And he gave the example of no, Rosie I didn't. O'Donnell. No, I didn't oh, hear well, that. Well, then you somehow are on the same script. Because it's actually Rosie O'Donnell's son who said that. And but he, nobody's he against that. anybody. Yeah, and, no, I understand. And, and, that's and, why all, I, and also, you know, homosexuality is a behavior. Right. It shouldn't define everything about the individual. Just like most of us, you know, uh, I mean, my entire life isn't dealing with sex, okay? Right. A very small portion of it, unfortunately. Right. Well, I'm sure. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, well, actually, the, anybody who's ever been married knows that marriage is not just about sex. Right. And so when gay people are seeking the freedom to marry, that's no more just about sex or even primarily about sex than it is for non-gay people. What it's about for gay people, as for non-gay people, is love and dedication and commitment and legal recognition and legal support. And, so to and, answer your question, and, and uh, actually, do, you, do you want an answer to your question? Did, did you want an answer or did you want I was answer? answering your question why government should be involved in this issue. Oh, well, I, I heard. And, and, and I stated that previous generations have had the opportunity right. I, no, to I heard be what you said. And, the role model of a mother and a father. Right. Well, but actually, as I'm sure you know, and if you don't know, you, all you have to do is actually look around you. You know that act, you, you can see that actually there are many different families in America. Some kids are raised by a mother and father. Some kids are raised by two mothers. Some kids are raised by two fathers. Some kids are raised by one mother, one father. Some kids are raised by grandparents. Some kids are raised by parents who are not their birth parents. Why would we want to put, no, no, The heterosexuals no, 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 no. haven't done a great job on I, marriage, you know. I mean, 
they've, they, you know. Well, that's uh, something. No, nobody's saying that, but the, I, we should be striving for that ideal. Right. Well, I, and, I, I, and there's listen. where we differ. No, no. Well, uh, see, you actually don't know where we differ yet because you <laughs> haven't let me answer your point. Okay. I, I heard the question you asked, and I think it's a valid question to ask. It comes right out of what the opponents say, so it's good of you to put it forward. Well, you're saying and, a lot of stuff that the other side says. Yeah, that's what I, that's what you're I do. You're very good at that, too. Thank you. And now what I'd like to do is actually respond <laughs> to what I assume are your legitimate concerns. Yeah. Okay? So the concerns you have raised, you have now stated. And here is the answer to it. There are many different families. Children are being raised by many different kinds of parents and configurations, some good, some bad. You just took a swipe at heterosexuals and said they haven't done a very good job of marriage. And that's true for some heterosexuals. On the other hand, there are heterosexuals like my parents who this year celebrated their 50th anniversary. And we threw a big party for them, my non-gay and gay siblings. <laughs> and family and friends came and we celebrated this wonderful occasion in the lives of my parents. They're not gay. They had a gay son. They want for their gay son the same happiness, the same protection, that they have cherished and enjoyed. If we care, no, no, you have to, you asked your question, now you have to at least listen to the answer. If we truly care about children, as the theme of your question is, your, your point is that you somehow care about kids and that's why we should discriminate against gay people. Exactly. And my point back to you is that if, if we care about kids, it actually makes no sense to punish the children being raised by your idea of, quote, the less than ideal kind of parent by withholding from those kids the protections and support that comes to them through marriage. Even if you were right and I was wrong, even if you were right that there's one ideal family and all the others are bad or inadequate or less good, and it's not just gay, it's, there are all kinds of different families. Adoptive parents, blended parents, blended families, remarried families, et cetera. So you, you apparently would sweep them all into well, a category. Well, you're changing the subject quite no, a bit. No, I'm answering your question. <laughs> you would sweep them all into the category of less than ideal. And let's assume for a moment you're right, which I don't think, but let's assume that you are. Even if you were right, what sense does it make to deprive the children who are being raised by the parents they have. Rosie O'Donnell's kid is not going to be taken away and given to your idea of ideal parents. He would not want that. So he is going to have the family he has. Why would we put obstacles by in that? By government excuse involving me. itself. No, excuse me. You have to let me finish. By government I will involving give you, itself I, in, listen, in defining, I will give you a follow -up. marriage. Excuse me, sir. It will prevent more children from ending up in that precarious situation. I will give you the follow-up, but you cannot interrupt me. Okay? I'm going to give you another follow-up, but you can't interrupt me because you asked a question, and here is the answer. It makes no sense to say to somebody of a, quote, Less, ide less than ideal family that they should be punished and further burdened and discriminated against by the government. Gay families exist, responding to the point you just made, as do all these other kinds of families. Gay parents will continue to exist in Illinois as in other states. Those families will exist. Their children will exist. Your piling on discrimination on those families will not make them go away. All they do is make their lives harder, make it harder for those kids. And there is no good social purpose or moral value served by doing that. It's now, nice having of said you, that, having said nice that, you apply excuse, a lot me, of excuse me, excuse me, you're applying excuse a me, lot of emotion. Gonna, listen, you're going to get your turn, but you have to wait your turn. Having said that and taken your premise as to the less than ideal, I want to be very clear that actually you're wrong about that too. These families are not less than ideal. The ideal family is a family where the parents, or sometimes one parent, puts the children first, gives that child love, gives that child structure, gives that child support, dedicates to the child, and helps build that child's future. That's the ideal 
parenting family. And every scrap of evidence we have and the testimony of every medical, psychological, educational, social work, and professional organization in the child welfare area that we have in this country, every single one, is that gay parents make fit and loving parents and their kids are doing just fine and would do better if they weren't being discriminated against. That is the truth. Bit of now it's here. Bit of here. <laughs> Now you're I, I might disagree with your statistics, and I would also wonder if some of those organizations you're referring to would be more politically, uh, uh, have a more of a political goal and agenda than be actually looking at the data honestly. Well, you, you, might, you might believe that. That's certainly your right to believe that as a matter of your faith. Your it faith, is no. Excuse me. You're filibustering. Your faith. You no. are filibustering. No, I'm giving you more time I, to speak. You I have, haven't hardly said anything. You've no. Excuse you've me. You've spoke more than I have by probably if we were timing well, it. To I am a speaker. That that would be inherent in the job. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm going to let you speak. But so you just made no. you you just let's, made a. Let's be a good host. Yes, and you. I'm the guest actually. You just made no. a point. You just. You just made a point. The point you just made now was to blow aside the testimony of every one of these scientific and psychological groups. So these are groups like, just to be very clear, the American Psychological Association, the American Psychiatric Association, the National Education Association, the American Public Health Association, the American Medical Association, and even the American Academy of Pediatrics, the nation's kids' doctors, you, to defend your position, have just, with one little swoop, said, well, they all have a political axe to grind, and I don't know if they amount to anything. But you have nothing to actually put on the table other There's, than your there, position. A lot of people may think that they're very wise in their thinking, mm -hmm. but it, it, I, I, I think uh, in, a, in their own minds, uh, yes. Uh, and, you know, in a politically correct environment, maybe. But I'm kind of looking at the big picture here, and uh, no one can deny that the homosexual lifestyle is an unhealthy lifestyle. You've got men dying at age 40. No, let, wouldn't you agree? Let's, let's just let, it, let's, let me give you one last crack at all the talking points from the opponent's website. These are all right off focus on the family's website. Go ahead and put them all out, and then I'm going to ask you actually <laughs> well, have to, I just have one ask other you to let others make their comments. Concerning so Solomon, uh, he was actually living in disobedience to God, and there were several consequences he suffered as a result of, of, of taking on all those wives from different religions and different faiths and cultures. And it was really a, an act of disobedience on Solomon's part. The, the nation of Israel suffered as a result, and Solomon himself personally suffered, and his family and all the, his children suffered as a result of disobedience. Okay, well, thank you now. You've had your time, and I guess <laughs> what I'm going to say to that last point is you are absolutely entitled to believe whatever you want about Solomon or about anything else. That is your absolute right as an American. But what you, what you really can't do with credibility is say that the American Academy of Pediatrics and all these other professionals don't know what they're talking about and somehow you do because you happen to know how bad gay people are. And I appreciate that you're filming for the Illinois Family Institute and they've now gotten a chance to have you on record and to hear the response. So I hope people will listen to it and engage further in the thinking. Are there other questions? Maybe one more. One more question. Just one more question. Last question. I, I, can you hear me? Yeah. OK. I had several questions, but I think I forgot one of them. Um, and the second one uh, you addressed <laughs> with, recently with uh, you know, talking about um, ideal parenting. Um, and not to say I disagree with any of that, but I would, would be curious to see how they define uh, what an ideal parent is. Who's, and, uh, excuse me? 
you said they, how they define that, like you know, the different associations and the studies that have been uh, done. Yeah. And and I guess, I guess the criteria for ideal parenting. Um, but my I guess my question um, is, what's the difference between marriage and a civil union, mm -hmm. and uh, and I guess for you, would you be satisfied if you know uh, homosexual um, marriage or homosexual couples given all the the same rights as heterosexual couples. Um, I, and I'm not sure if, if this is a correct fact here, but I heard that in France, um, for example, they would have marriage and that's done under religious context and they would have a thing called Pax, which is government. So people would go there, get a Pax, and they would have all the same rights as you know, a person who gets married. Uh -huh. Can you just talk a little bit about that? Sure, well on your first question, uh, as I said, the way these groups talk about parenting is they look at the indicators to measure how children are doing. They look at indicators like getting in trouble in school, performing well in school, that, those kind of you know, health questions, et cetera. The child's own sense of self-esteem and self-worth, and they look at these measures. And by these measures, all of these groups find that the children are doing well and that the gay parents are fit and loving and that all things being equal across the lines, that the quality of parenting is not determined by the sexual orientation of the parent, but by the qualities of love and commitment and s discipline and self-sacrifice and all those other things I talked about. And that those can be found in gay parents as in non-gay parents. And there are some non-gay parents who are bad and there are some gay parents who are bad. So that's what these groups are looking at. And what they also conclude is that those kids would be better off if opponents would stop discriminating against their families and would enable the parents to provide the best to their kids, just as non-gay parents want to provide, we hope, the best to their kids. So on your other question, or cluster of questions, the answer to your question is, in terms of would I be satisfied with something separate and other and lesser than full and complete fairness and equality? And the answer is no, of course not. And, the, and you might ask why. And there are several answers to that question. One is that one of the main protections that comes with marriage is the word marriage. Marriage is this vocabulary, this statement, this immediately understood statement of who you are in relationship to someone else. That no matter where you are, no matter who you're dealing with, whether you're fighting with a government agency or trying to get into a hospital in the time of emergency or enrolling your kid in school or taking out a mortgage or doing any of the things we all do in the ups and downs and crises of life, marriage is a vocabulary that's immediately understood. It is not equal to say to some families, you can't have that security, that clarity, that dignity, but instead you have to pull out 15 documents and hire a lawyer and fight each time you need something, and then even then you don't know whether you're gonna get it. That's not equality. So that's one answer to your question. A second answer to your question is that in our, in our country, there's only one system as a legal matter that provides full responsibilities and protections for family in every state and between the state and the federal government and amongst private businesses and individuals. And that one system is called marriage. Civil union or partnership or some of these other legal statuses that are beginning to emerge in the course of this national conversation about ending discrimination against gay couples are good things, but they're not a system. It's not like we have two really great clubs and gay people are just being told to go to that one while the non-gay people get to be in that one, but they're both equally good. There's one club, there's one system, and it's called marriage. People who enter into a civil union or a partnership, which they can only do in three states at the level of civil union and two more states at the level of partnership, and Illinois, by the way, is not, none of those, so it doesn't exist here. People who can enter into those legal commitments those new status, family statuses, do acquire certain important legal protections and respect that actually are very good for them and help them. But they're far short of the thousands of legal and economic consequences that come only with marriage. 
most of which you can't replace even if you do hire a lawyer and pay tons of money. You can't contract for Social Security. You can't contract for immigration rights or access to veterans benefits or the countless ways in which we interact as families with the government. So there is no equal that can just be done by giving it and calling it something else. But even if there were, even if somehow magically that could happen, it still would not be good enough because our country has gone down this path before. And you have to ask yourself, and each one of us has to really ask ourselves and our neighbors and our friends this very simple question. Either marriage and partnership or civil union or whatever else you want to call it is, are the same, in which case, why do we need two lines at the clerk's office? Or else they're not the same. In which case, what is the government withholding and why? What's the reason for withholding it? And my last answer to you on that question is, even if you didn't agree with anything I just said, the opponents of gay people, the anti-gay groups who are marching and mobilizing around the country, including the Illinois Family Institute, are not just against marriage for gay people. They're against any measure of protection. They're against civil union. They're against partnership. They're against health coverage. They're against bereavement leave so that you can even go to your, the funeral of your loved ones. They're against prison visitation rights. They're against any acknowledgment of gay people as part of the fabric of this community. The amendment that they're pushing would cement into Illinois' Constitution a ban on cities, and the state legislature and anyone acknowledging any small slice of these families' needs, from marriage right through down to the smallest. And so from my point of view is if we're going to have to have this conversation and talk with our neighbors and help them understand who gay people are and fight for equal rights against opponents who are raising money to divide Americans, if we're going to have to do it anyway, why not fight for what we really deserve, a country that treats everybody fairly? Thank you.